Let's start this morning hearing from the government. A few moments ago, I spoke to the leader of the House of Commons, Penny Mordaunt. Good morning. I'd like to start with the awful story of Nicola Bully, who's been missing now for more than three weeks. Both the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister have expressed concern about the handling of the investigation. Uh, do you share that concern? Well, I can't imagine what this must have been like for her family. It's bad enough if a, a member of your family goes, goes missing, but to have all this additional uh, drama and distraction from the most important thing, which is to find out what has happened uh, to her. Um, my thoughts are, are with them. I think the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary have been right to express concerns about that. But, but really, the priority here has been what it always should have been, which is to find her. OK. Let's talk about the political news. And, of course, top story today is going to be Northern Ireland. The Prime Minister says that we may be close to a deal, but we're not there yet. Uh, what are the obstacles that remain to an agreement that would allow Stormont to reassemble and possibly allow you not to have to uh, pursue the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill? Well, look, there are encouraging signs, but the Prime Minister has said that there is still hard work to be done and uh, everyone will be pulling together to ensure uh, that we're giving that deal the, the best chance possible. What matters here, and the Prime Minister is very focused on this, is what the people of Northern Ireland think about this deal. This has to be acceptable to all communities in Northern Ireland, and the EU is aware of that. So. I, I wish them well. I think it would be great if we can arrive at that point. Uh, but that's the test. It's not what I or any other member of the Commons thinks. It's the people of Northern Ireland. But how close is close? Is it days or are we weeks away, months? What do you think? Look, I think, I think good progress has been made, but clearly there is still more to be done. Both, both sides of the, the negotiations have said we're not there yet. Um, but those negotiations are still progressing and... Uh, and there are, there are optimistic signs. All right, well, look, um, uh, people can be helpful, and they can be less helpful. And um, let's talk about the various uh, parties to this. Some in your own party say that the European Court of Justice should play no part, for example, in settling disputes uh, between Britain and the EU on trade. Um, can you envisage any agreement in which the ECJ plays no part at all being acceptable to the EU? Look, I'm not party to the negotiations. I'm not cited on the detail. But what I can tell you is that unless this deal uh, is um, satisfactory to, to all communities in Northern Ireland, it, it won't be possible. It's not going to work. But it's also the, going to be satisfactory to the EU, hasn't it? It, it has. But the... I mean, the DUP's tests uh, that they have referred to are not a random wish list. They are promises that we have made to the, to the people of Northern Ireland. That, that is the, the bar that this deal has to, has to get over. And, uh, and I know that the Prime Minister is completely focused on that. Uh, you're in danger of being a bit clear here, which is unusual. The DUP's seven tests involve no role for the ECJ. Are you saying that this can't happen unless that test is met? The Prime Minister is focused on removing those practical difficulties, but he has also been talking about the, the democratic deficit. He's been talking about ensuring that the people of Northern Ireland, through their representatives, are able to have a say on any future uh, regulation uh, that they might be subject to. These are important things. It is very tough. It's tough stuff. But that is what the Prime Minister is focused on. I've no further detail on the, on the nitty-gritty of the, of the negotiations, Trevor, but I, I think there are encouraging signs, but there is a lot more to be done. Uh, absence of detail doesn't seem to have discouraged um, some of your colleagues from having a view, including uh, the former Prime Minister, who says... Um, or rather a source close to Mr Johnson uh, saying this morning that it would be a great mistake to drop the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. The story behind this is that apparently he thinks that it's absolutely essential to make sure that you have 
leverage that you retain the ability to withdraw unilaterally from um, the, the protocol. Do you think it is possible to reach an agreement that would satisfy that part of your party? Well, look, I think the, the first thing to say is, and I think the Prime Minister would acknowledge this, we're, we're only able to be having these negotiations and discussions because of what previous administrations have done. And the command paper and the, the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill have been helpful to get us where we are today. I think that's, that's the first thing. And uh, the intervention by a source close to the, the previous Prime Minister is helpful to remind uh, the EU uh, of, that, uh, of that bill and uh, what this deal actually has to deliver. But uh, I'll come back to it, Trevor. It's not about me or any other member of Parliament. It is about the communities in Northern Ireland and getting this to work for them. That is our priority. I, I know it's your job to be diplomatic, but seriously, you think that Boris Johnson's intervention is helpful? I think that all parties want this to be a success. They want those very practical issues that the people of Northern Ireland have been grappling with and that are uh, causing unnecessary friction in our trading arrangements. They, they want the, the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom to be uh, a, a certainty. Th this is what we all want. It's difficult, but we are making progress. And, uh, and I wish the Prime Minister well. But uh, forgive me. Uh... I understand what you're trying to say, that there needs to be a consensus, everybody needs to be generous and so on. But it's already clear that for some members of your party, and I'm going to come to the DUP in a moment, there are red lines. Uh, John Redwood, who senior member of the party, he represents a particular strain of opinion, has tweeted this morning words to the effect that the EU consultation with the Northern Ireland Assembly would still leave Northern Ireland under EU control. These people are not going to come quietly, are they? They're not going to be as generous as you apparently are being this morning. Well, it's again, it's not about a, a winning a vote in the in the Commons. We 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 don't know what the um, following procedures will will need to be. It, it all depends on what that uh, what that deal is, and if we if we get to a, a deal at all. But uh, I, I think everyone is, uh, is agreeing with each other. Unless we have every community in Northern Ireland behind this deal, it, it won't last and it won't work. We, that, this is why this is difficult. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's at moments like this when, when governments and prime ministers are tested. And the prime minister is been absolutely clear that the priority in this is the people of Northern Ireland. That, that is what he has in his mind. Uh, and what his team have in their minds when they're negotiating. All right, well, I'll give this one last go. What, what is Boris Johnson actually up to? Well, Boris is, is being Boris, but I wouldn't <laughs> say this is, this is a completely unhelpful uh, intervention. <laughs> I... Um, I, and I think, as I say, the Prime Minister, uh, I think, will acknowledge that uh, having the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill there, having the, the work uh, that the former Prime Minister did is has helped us get where we are. But it's always been our preference to try and have a negotiated settlement. And, and that is what everyone is working to. There's right. still a lot to be done, All but right. progress let, has been made. All right, let me take you a word about the Northern Ireland communities. Uh, the, the Democratic Unionist Party has been pretty clear. Uh, I've put some of the points that they share with members of your party to you already. Um, if they don't come into line, um, Stormont is not going to reassemble. Uh, is the government ready to, for example, resume direct rule if the Assembly simply just can't sit because the DUP won't accept a deal? So, look, we, we have, and we've, we've done this previously, we, we've had to step in. We, we obviously want to make sure that there's a, there's a budget there. We, we are the backstop for... Uh, for, for the assembly, that's that's always been the case. But but we want uh, we want government to be to be re-established in in Northern Ireland. That yeah. is that is what we we want. And 
It's, it a, is, great, it's it a great is, aspiration, some... but you haven't been able to do it, and that's not necessarily your fault. If, if Mr Donaldson and his colleagues, Sir Geoffrey, I beg your pardon, Donaldson and his colleagues say, we're not going to play ball, are you ready to resume direct rule? Look, there is, there is obviously an element of, of local politics in all of this, but, but fundamentally, the, the deal that the Prime Minister is trying to uh, negotiate at the moment is, is going to be a key part of getting the Assembly stood up again. That is why it is absolutely critical that all parties have confidence in the process and have confidence with what is arrived at. We, we don't know whether we're going to be able to secure a deal or not, but if we do, um, and it's a good one, then that will play a big part in, uh, in getting the Assembly re-established. You're obviously very hopeful, and um, the Labour Party says that, um, actually, they will support uh, a deal if it's one that, for example, maintains uh, the integrity of the Good Friday uh, Agreement. Um, are you OK about that, that you might actually have to, if you have to, introduce legislation, and it's possible you might not to, but if you do have to introduce legislation, are you happy to uh, get that legislation through on the back of uh, Labour votes uh, against some Conservative opposition and DUP opposition? Well, look, this is a hypothetical situation about, about having a vote. We don't, we don't know what a deal is going to look like and whether, uh, whether we will need to, to do that or not. Um, I would hope, if we arrive at a good deal, that everyone would be supporting it. But I, I come back to the point, Trevor, and I, I'm sorry to um, repeat it, but it is a pretty fundamental one. It doesn't really matter what any of us in the House of Commons think about this. The deal has to satisfy the people of Northern Ireland. OK. All right. Um, elsewhere, Mr McLynch says that they're going to stop the trains again, the RCN, first time in its history. It's going out on a 48-hour strike without cover. Junior doctors yesterday say they're likely to come out. Um, is it the ministers... Is it minister, ministers' position still that it's not much you can do to stop this chaos? Look, I think it is political cynicism of the worst kind to encourage strikes. The only people that benefit from strikes are the Labour Party. Striking workers don't benefit from strikes. And uh, I think it's lunacy to say to people the best way to help make ends meet is to drive those ends further apart. These, these are not helpful. Uh, we need to focus on issues that, that each sector is facing. Those are what the respective secretaries of state are, are doing. But, but strikes are not helpful, and I would encourage people not to, not to do that. Well, I, I can't speak for Mr Lynch or Ms Cullen or the BMA, but I suspect that if they were here, they'd say they're not, much, they're not very helpful to you, but they might be helpful to these striking workers. And let, so let me ask you again. It's going to happen... Is the government's view still that it cannot play a role in avoiding these strikes? Strikes are not helpful to striking workers. No, but that's not the question I'm strikes, asking you. Well, I'm asking it's, you it's, what the government can and what, can what do. Let me what you said, because it's important. Striking workers lose pay out of their pay packets when they're on strike. If their union demands are met with an inflationary pay rise, they lose, because that equates to about £1,000 extra in tax per household, and you, you, it doesn't help on, uh, on the issue we, that everyone is facing on inflation. Strikes do not help striking workers. Strikes only help the Labour Party. But and about... it's the same attitude, Trevor, that, hang about, hang that about. brought you, you, miners you, you, out you've on strike at the start of the warmest summer on record. It's the, it's the same old dogma and situation. The only thing that is going to enable us to make progress on, on the genuine issues that certain sectors are facing is, is discussions. Yes. Discussions around... Hang stresses on. on the NHS and, and all of hang that. Hang on, hang on. And you can, that is what secretaries... You can tell them that it's not helpful to them till you're blue in the face, but from their point of view, if they get a pay rise, that is going to be helpful, surely. I mean, that's not what, it, they're, not that's what they're embeds, there for. Not if it embeds inflation. Uh, no. Um, they, they are... It's, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, a, it's but, a myth that strikes are helpful. They're not. They, they exacerbate uh, financial problems for the very people going out on strike. And they also are going to have a knock-on effect on okay. uh, cancelled appointments, on missed education, 
uh, it's it's not good for the country, and I'd encourage people not to do it. Yeah, but they but they're going to get poorer anyway because inflation hasn't been conquered, as Mr. Hunt never tires of telling us. So they're getting poorer year by year anyway. Let me put it to you again: Is the government simply going to sit on its hands and say, "Look, you chaps, you're not helping anybody. You're, you know, it, it's a little bit school teacherish. You're you're wasting your own time here." I mean, honestly, no, the, can the ministers government... do nothing? No, the, the ministers are, are doing a lot. The, the, you will know that the prime minister's priorities, three of them, are on are focused on the economy, including halving uh, in inflation. Uh, that should be our focus. That is what is going to benefit those individuals. It will benefit also uh, the, the rest of the country as well. So we're, we're very focused on this. But uh, make no mistake, the strikes are not helping. All right, look, um, Mr Sunak said yesterday he wants everybody to double down to support Ukraine. Um, we're not sending fighter, fighter jets, despite the um, clear uh, the appeal that Mr Zelensky uh, made uh, to us, are we? Just to be clear, we're not going to send well, fighter jets. Well, look, we, we've not ruled out uh, particular things, and indeed the Prime Minister has asked the Defence Secretary to look at a, a raft of things, including uh, aircraft, and we are obviously providing oh. training support. Um, but the Defence Secretary is also, he's very focused on what is going to help long term, but also in the immediate future. And the Prime Minister's speech at the Security uh, Summit in Munich was really a, a, a call to other nations to recognise the critical period we are in now in That's terms of Ukraine securing that victory. That's interesting. There was a world in which uh, Penny Morden might have been the Defence Secretary. Would, the Penny, would Penny Morden as Defence Secretary have wanted to send fighter jets if we had any to spare? I'm, com I'm completely in step with Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace, I think, has been a fantastic Defence Secretary. He is very focused on giving Ukraine the support that it needs. Um, we have led uh, Europe in providing that support and uh, we're doing a huge amount and we will continue to do that. What we have also said is we are going to step that up. I in the next few months we're going to be sending more than we did uh, in the entire um, yeah. period of last year and, and that is because we have to bring this, this war to an end. We have to help Ukraine secure that victory that is in everyone's interest. And this is a really critical period for them to do that. Uh, there are limits to what we can do, surely. Um, there's a, a former uh, chief of, uh, actually, a chief of uh, Army General, um, Sir Richard Barons, who says today we need another three billion uh, pounds. We hear that the uh, a year to keep uh, our status as a leading European military power. Uh, we hear that the Defence Secretary wants another 10 billion uh, a year. We understand that our own munitions uh, stocks are being depleted because we're helping the Ukrainians. Uh, are we going to do whatever it takes, whatever it does to our own military capacity? We know this is our first job as a government. Uh, and our record in government has been that we have prioritised uh, defence and we have kept defence spending strong, always met our NATO commitments. But for those worried about this, I would say, listen to what the Prime Minister said in Munich. Listen to what the government said uh, in the autumn statement last year, which recognised the need to increase defence spending. Look at what the Chancellor has previously said the son of an admiral, one of the most experienced yes. people in cabinet, about his desire to increase defence spending to 3%, as he has made uh, a commitment in previous years. And look at Ben Wallace, um, okay. who no one can doubt his commitment to our armed forces. Okay. I am confident we will keep defence spending strong okay. and it will be the priority for this government. OK, I'm only hurrying you along because, of course, the big develop biggest pure political development has been the decision of the Scottish First Minister to stand down. Um, no, nobody really knows the full truth of why she's made that decision, uh, but one element surely must have been the decision of the Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack to block Holyrood's legislation on gender recognition. Given what you yourself have said on this issue, do you really think that Alistair Jack was correct to do that? Did you support that decision? Yes, he was, because this is a matter 
not so much about the, the, the rights or wrongs or the merits of, of what Scotland was, was trying to, to do for trans people. It was about the impact it was having on the rest of the UK. Uh, there have but been many, you... many positive things about devolution, but it has torn at the social fabric of the United Kingdom. And the but... impact of what Scotland was, was doing on the, on the workings, as, as you will well know, of the Equalities Act, was a serious problem. But, Scotland but every, knew about but, this. But, but everything uh, that you have said recently uh, in the past, uh, including the period when you yourself were Minister for Equalities, suggests that you would have supported the Scottish legislation. No, is that I, true? No, on the issue itself, I wouldn't have because I did not wish for uh, this to be split out from healthcare. I think this this was a very Im important thing that it remained in healthcare. But what we think about the merits of what Scotland were trying to do is not the issue here. The reason why Alistair Jack has done what he has done is because what Scotland was trying to do was going to have uh, an impact on the workings of the Equalities Act okay. across the whole of the UK. Penny Morden, thank you very much. Thank you.